screen now. Uh, this is the screen, uh, what, what we're hoping to cover on the screen now. I'm not going to go through and read it out because we will go through it individually. Um, um, with a bit at a time. So um, I wanted to start off with the Public Health England information. And um, it was about uh, the All Our Health initiative. So all our health is aimed at preventing illness, uh, protecting health and promoting well-being, which is what, what occupational health, health and safety, HR people are doing um, within the working environment as, a, as a, a, a holistic approach, really. And all our health is the Public Health England approach. And it's focused on support, uh, supporting um, uh, the different stages of life with the aim of improving health and reducing health inequalities. And it provides us with a public health outcome framework supporting care for individual and local communities as well as larger populations. And if you think about our individual um, uh, businesses as a, an individual community, you'll start to see where this all ties together. Uh, my thoughts in relation to the overall philosophy, which is on the screen at the minute, is, is it tends to be focused on worklessness rather than people in the working environment. And so we need to dig down a little bit further into the All Our Health um, framework to be, under, to be able to understand how that strategic approach applies to us. So this is the uh, strategic approach as they're talking about it. And we're talking about responding to local population needs. So our local populations are the same as the organisation themselves. And I want to draw out this idea of having an organisational need. And it, this kind of will go through the, the themes throughout this session this afternoon. We're looking at uh, healthy workplaces. So this healthy places bit is looking at how we can make our working environments healthy. And they are suggesting that we're looking towards this life course, life course approach to prevention and care, supporting both resilience and independence. Um, and um, you're going to have to excuse me this afternoon because I have a special plea and I'm hoping that you all get on board with this. Uh, because we're talking about individuals as well as wider community. I'm going to put a really shameless plug in here. Uh, and it'll just sneak up individually throughout the slides. Please, please, um, I was going to say I'll accept my apology, but I don't make any apologies for it. I am being shameless. But if you would be willing to support this, uh, this uh, initiative, I'd be grateful. So this is about um, an individual. It's about supporting an individual's health. And this is Bo. Bo's the five-year-old from Liversidge, near where we are based, who's got stage four high-risk neuroblastoma. And uh, the guys are looking to raise £317,000 to get her potentially life-saving treatment in the Swarton Clinic in New York. So the 50% there at the minute, and all we're going to say to you is throughout this presentation this afternoon, please help. There's the link. So back on to Public Health England. Uh, the Public Health England um, initiatives are focusing on positive and negative influences across the life course. Okay. And so what we've got here are these protective factors that we can put in place and the risk factors. And I want you to keep an eye on these that are coming through here. So if you look at the protective factors, we're talking about diet, moving more, educational attainment, um, good stable income, um, good quality housing and support network. And from a risk factors perspective, we're looking at smoking. I'm going to focus on specific ones in relation to the working environment, but uh, drugs and alcohol misuse. Again, it's the educational attainment and it's poor mental health. So you can you're going to start to see these themes coming out through all the different um, uh, strategies across the different organisations. A person's physical and mental health and well-being are influenced throughout the life cycle by these wider determinants of health. And there's a diverse range of social, economical, and environmental factors alongside the behavioural risk factors that cluster within populations and affect people's health and well-being. And so when we're starting talking about these protective and preventative um, risk factors, um, these are the bits that we need to be having a look at. What are they talking about as far as this life course event concerned? Because there's all sorts of language going on around here. Uh, 
And basically what they're talking about is, is that we are intrinsically capable of uh, managing our own health and uh, mental and physical health up to a certain point. But what this is saying is, is that we can uh, put um, additional factors in, social factors, environmental factors, to be able to boost that up so you get a higher functional ability. And so when we're starting talking about using this life coach approach to health, it's basically saying, look at the social and the environmental things that we can put in place to boost the health of individuals, to boost the functional capacity, capacity excuse me. So we're talking about things like um, in the UK, in the first world, we've got easy access to, to glasses so that we can see better and correct poor vision. We've got dropped pavements to be able to enable easy access for pushchair and wheelchair users. We've got um, affordability of healthy food. We've got access to the NHS and all that sort of stuff. Those are extrinsic factors that we have that we can boost up into to improve our functional ability. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you look at the work in life itself, this is the work in the life course approach. We actually straddle, I've gone across the childhood and adolescence because they're causing it, calling it from five to 24. But if we're picking up the work in environment and we may have 16 to 18 year olds or 18 to, to retirement really, whatever those ages are, but also we've got the idea of uh, pregnant workers also or breastfeeding mums within the working environment that can also hit uh, the early years as well. So it's to have a look at all of those generations that are within the working environment. And what we're trying to look at is how do we maintain good functional ability throughout the life course? Um, so that might be altering policies, the environment, societal norms, uh, looking at impacting on inequalities that affects uh, the life course itself. So that's Public Health England's approach um, to the healthy working environment. So what I thought I'd do now is, is to have a look at the World Health Organization. So they've got a definition of the uh, uh, healthy workforce, which I've put up there for you. I'm not going to read it out to you, but I wanted to start looking at the information in themes. Public Health England, we're talking about protective and risk factors. Um, and what this is doing is starting to look at the protective and risk factors associated with the World Health Organization recommendation. So if we look at um, the top two at themes, and then we look at the more individual, wider societal themes in three and four separately. In my terms, the first two are they're addressed with good health and safety and good HR um, approaches that are integrated within the organisation and its culture. So if you're identifying good physical and mental health risks and following those hierarchical controls, in a continual improvement cycle. So we've got the action plans, the project work, risk reduction, stress management planning, you know, right the way through to the mental health first aid approach. We're covering the first two of those in the stuff that's basically compliance, okay? If we then start to look at the personal health and resources aspect, which is the third bit, we're talking about individual risk assessment, adjustment, support, training, Influence in promoting healthy work, uh, work behaviours and, uh, and healthy be uh, behaviours of workers and their families. And it might be that we're looking at things like sickness absence management, rehabilitating, re rehabilitation plans, reasonable adjustments, whether they're disabled or not. Um, making easy access to GP appointments. Um, one of the, the things that we're seeing is, is people uh, in certain working environments aren't allowed to use the um, uh, phones, but they can't actually register for a GP appointment until a certain time. So how do we allow them to get those phone calls made? Have we got buddy systems in to help new starters so they settle in, that sort of stuff? <coughs> and then the fourth aspect is about supporting individuals and the families as well. So are we providing a living wage, stable employment? Are people relying on overtime? Have we got flexible working to support around the child children? Um, 
uh, have we got uh, literacy and IT literacy classes in there? If we know that people that have got literacy problems are unable to access health uh, care services as easier uh, as people that are literate, then can we look at working with local colleges uh, on getting those literacy programmes in? Quite often they're funded. Um, extending health plans, tapping into the local public um, health departments for smoking cessation courses, those types of things. So those are talking about how we can influence the health of workers in a really proactive way. Uh, other things are things like the cycle to work schemes and that sort of stuff. So that's the World Health Organization approaches. And it goes on a little bit further um, to include um, a, a, a healthy workplace framework. And their framework goes along the lines of mobilize, assemble, assess, prioritize, plan, do, evaluate, and prove. And you'll have to excuse me for just saying, right, okay, we're used to this, but we just call it plan, do, check, and act. So we're just following the same things that we would follow if we're doing um, 45,001 or the other environmental ones. It is that same Deming cycle of plan, do, check, act. Okay. Um, so let's just keep it simple and talk in the language that we need to use. Um, in 2006, uh, there was a, a study that was done about good health, being, good work being good for you. Um, and it was published by uh, two guys called uh, Gordon Model and King Burton. Uh, and it was an important piece of work, really, because what it was saying is, is um, pretty much what we already knew anyway, was that employment, um, um, uh, the most important means of obtaining adequate economic resources, which is essential for material well-being and fulfillment within the society. It also said that work meets an important psychosocial need in, a, in, in society where employment is the norm and that it is central to an individual's identity, social role, social status, um, and they are the main drivers of the social um, gradients in physical and mental health. Um, Dame Carol Black then built on this work. Dame Carol Black, if, you, if you're not familiar with the work that she's done, she's kind of like the health and safety czar, really. And she published a re review of the health of Britain's working age population and recognised that the beneficial impact that work can have on individual state of health and that work is generally good for both physical and mental health. And that was um, supported by a DWP research study. Now, one of the things that I've noticed throughout all of this, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, there's loads and loads of qualitative data about the outcomes of health and well-being initiatives within the working environment. What we're not actually seeing is a vast amount of quantitative data being published. So um, the qualitative data from the DWP survey agreed that employers were recognising the financial benefits of spending money on employee health and well-being and that they outweigh the cost of the actual um, implementation of strategies themselves. What we haven't got from any of this, though, is, is what that cost-benefit analysis was in real terms. And I think that, that that's quite interesting from my perspective, because I'm a suspicious old bird, as those that have known me for a while know. Uh, and you'll probably recognise that, um, that I will be sitting there saying, well, if you haven't got quantitative data at this point, it's suggesting that either data is not available or it's not supporting what you think it should be supporting to the extent it should be supporting. But that may, may be just me being a suspicious old bird, like I was saying. So the DWP um, Promotion of Health and Wellbeing at Work initiatives, um, I've bobbed them down there for you, so I'm not going to start reading them out, but they are looking, if you're looking at the top, I'll work the way down. Um, and uh, so we're talking about things like health and safety training, more than 20 days holiday per year, doing your workplace assessments and adjustments, allowing employees to work reduced or different hours, meeting with employees to discuss extra help that they may need. Uh, working flexi time from home or job sharing, doing your stress management stuff or providing EAPs, counselling, occupational health, putting in your HSE stress, interven uh, stress management interventions in place, appraisals, informal discussions, taking positive steps to improve job satisfaction. And then from a worker engagement perspective, 
communicating with them, using your notice boards, using your management chain to cascade information up and down and gaining feedback from employees and getting them involved in the actual planning of your health and wellbeing initiative. From a productivity and performance perspective, they're talking about sickness absence strategies, employee retention strategies, and they're talking about occupational sick pay. At no point at this stage um, are, are anybody starting talking about following health promotion calendars? They're looking at it as a, as a more generic uh, approach, as a more strategic approach. So if we're looking at this good work is good work, good for you. Again, there's some further work that's been done um, from Public Health England. And these are what they're saying good work is. So good work's defined. I'm not going to read that out again. But can I just go back to my previous comments and say all of this is ensured by good HR and good health and safety. Just give me a chance to read through that. So moving on to uh, CIPD wellbeing at work, stuff that came out last year, 2021. Uh, again, what they're saying is, is fostering employee well-being is good for people and it's good for the organisation. Promoting well-being can prevent stress and create a positive working environment where individuals and organisations uh, thrive. Healthy workplaces help people to flourish and help uh, them reach their optimum potential. And healthy workplaces create an environment that actively promotes the state of contentment. Um, <clears throat> they've given us three, um, seven main domains of well-being. I popped them up onto the board for you. And what they're suggesting is, is that actually no one size fits all. When you're designing a health and well-being strategy, its content should be based on unique needs and characteristics of the organisation and the workforce. And this is where we go back to when we were saying at the beginning, this is about the health needs of your organisation. So what, what works for you may not work for other people. We can steal and beg ideas from other people, and that's really great because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. But do have a look at what it is that you're actually uh, wanting to achieve. So when they're looking at um, the key domains, domain, uh, domains uh, physical health, they're talking about good rehabilitation practices, health checks, well-being benefits, health assure, insurance protection, managing people with disabilities, occupational health support, employee assistance programmes, safe working practices, safe equipment, personal safety training, stress risk assessments, conflict resolution, training line managers to have difficult conversations, managing mental ill health, occupational health support to assist people back into the working environment. Um, from a good working perspective, they're talking about ergonomic design in working areas, open inclusive cultures, effective people management policies, training for line managers, sickness absence management, making sure your work demands uh, are there. So it's all the bits and pieces that you would expect to see um, that mirror the HSE stress, in, um, at stress management standards. Uh, with the addition on the bottom end of that is making sure that you've got a fair and transparent remuneration practices and no fin non-financial recognition as well. So again, this is coming back to your really good HR and your um, health and safety processes. Um, Values-based leadership, you've got clear missions and objectives, health and safety and health and well-being strategies, corporate governance. Uh, dignity at work, um, uh, valuing differences, so your quality diversity approaches, cultural engagement and training for employees and managers. Um, communicating with your colleagues, um, consulting them and having genuine valuable dialogue with them to try and encourage them to, uh, uh, within the decision making um, uh, change really making sure that people have got the career growth, um, development, so that they've got this uh, personal development planning, they've got positive relationships at work, and so on and so forth. So that's available. If you want any information on there, there is some information on the CIPD work, um, the website. If you look through wellbeing at work, it gives you loads and loads of examples of the types of things that you can put in place as a checklist. 
<coughs> and I'm just going to go on to the uh, health and safety executive scans with this. In health and safety law, uh, there are things that you must do to make sure that the employee's health is not adversely affected by their work. And basically what we say is, is health, um, we're looking at the way that health impacts on work and work impacts on health, okay? So from a strategic perspective and a compliance perspective, we need to be putting in health and medical in, uh, surveillance, fitness to work, um, reviewing sickness absence risk, uh, reviewing risk assessments on a sickness absence or if they've declared an ill health issue. And what it specifically says, which I was, uh, I want to get through uh, this afternoon, is a really important point. There is lots of things that we can do to improve the general health and well-being of workers. However, these actions should not be prioritised over the things that you must do. So get your compliance in first. Be based on your workers' health needs and be evidence-based, okay? Make sure that you, when you're putting in a process in place that there's evidence of, of the information that you're passing out, that it is um, recognised information. So there are certain stamps that you can look for to genuinely ensure that the information you're passing out is accurate. So from a business approach perspective, this is our approach and we, we've ragged it, um, which you would expect us to do uh, from an occupational health perspective. We tend to um, red, amber, green, everything. So red is the stuff that's health and safety and HR compliance. So if you go through that, we're looking at uh, health risk management, mental health risk uh, assessment and training, musculoskeletal support um, and, and risk reduction. I'm mentioning those specifically because Mental health and musculoskeletal are the biggest causes of um, sickness absence within the UK um, and the biggest work-related ill health uh, uh, injury uh, that we've got reports of at the minute. Toolbox talks are important, making sure that people are fit to travel, immunisations, those types of things. So that is your compliance stuff. We then start looking at business risk. So whenever we're trying to get in, uh, anything that put in to support a company, uh, you get people that really, really want these health and well-being initiatives being put in place, and then they'll get up to the financial director and they'll go, show me the money. So I would say to you guys, that if you're going to do anything along these lines, get back to the money. You need to be able to have those things in place to be able to demonstrate value for money. Um, so it may be that you have a high level of musculoskeletal um, sickness absence, um, or injuries, in which case do we need to put physiotherapy in very early stage to help with a, a speedy recovery. What we're seeing in occupational health is, is by the time they've got through to physiotherapy through the NHS, you can be looking at eight to 12 weeks before you can get a, a, a telephone assessment, physiotherapy is being delivered over the telephone, uh, and uh, we're still sort of, the jury's out about how well that works. Sometimes it works really, really well. And sometimes it doesn't work at all and it's hard to engage people over the telephone. Same happens with counselling. So if we've got mental health issues, can we, um, we're struggling to get a, a quick response within uh, the NHS. Uh, they've been inundated following um, the COVID um, uh, pandemic and uh, they were struggling before that, to be fair. So how, can we get in the ACP counselling, cognitive behavioural therapy and EAP? So there's telephone support financial support, those types of things. Have we got some mental health first aiders so we can signpost people in the right direction? Do we have some health and wellbeing champion training that we can put into place? And then the final bit then we put in on is, is this, this wellbeing initiative and these are the bits that are nice to have. So if we go back to the Public Health England stuff, we're talking about this protective factors and the risk factors. And we put those as a reminder at the bottom of the page for you with a little bit of one on the bottom that I've added, which is the sleep one. So do you want to look at these from digital and poster campaigns? Do we have life coaches there? Do we have health and wellbeing days that we're looking at and targeting these specific, in, uh, specific in, um, risk factors? Or do we start to embrace community, community initiatives that we talked about earlier, such as bringing in people for the literacy, numeracy and IT literacy programmes, or uh, getting hold of the Smoke Free England initiative where we can get 
smoking cessation councils perhaps set up on site so that you're having um, counselling, we call it smoking cessation counselling, um, uh, on your working environment so people can access it easily. So if it, things are easier to access, people tend to participate a little bit more. So all these, in essence, uh, are, again, I'm going to say this, is it's good HR and good health and safety practices. Um, it's our, um, this is our approach to it. We tend to go through this with people, um, uh, you know, make sure that you are getting that compliance first approach. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir because the majority of people here today are from a health and safety background. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was to make sure that everything was uh, evidence-based and targeted. And so if we're demonstrating, we talked about seeking funding for the initiatives that we're putting in place. If we're demonstrating the return of investment of wellbeing activities, we need to look at how we're going to uh, capture quantifiable information uh, on their impact. Um, and so what I was looking at to say, well, what is it that we can or we do capture already and how can we use those key metrics to be able to uh, uh, identify what this organisational health needs are. So I've put some information on there, it's just a, a bit of an example really. This is a, a, an example of a comparison of days lost due to sickness absence. Uh, and what we're using here is, those of that haven't seen these breakdowns before, they're quite a useful breakdown. Uh, these are called the sickness absence recording tool classifications and it's based on the World Health Organisation disease classification. It just helps you um, use data that's then comparable um, with other people. If for those of you that are, are, are working with others, you can use the same sort of comparisons. And we tend to use the SAT codings as an example for that. So on here, you'll notice that we've got a problem with 15% back problems and there's another 90% of musculoskeletal problems. So do we have ergonomic issues? There's 20% of people, or 20% of the days lost due to sickness, absence associated with uh, anxiety, depression, and stress. So those issues are, are, are quite significant for this organization. The other data that I would suggest that you look at is the number of episodes, because if you then compare the number of days lost to the number of episodes, it helps to give you an indication of whether they are long-term or short-term absences. Um, and you'll see a, a marked difference between the two, because it may be when you're looking at that 15% of back problems being, uh, of day loss being due to back problems, it may be one person. And if it's only one person, we're only paying out a small amount of money for physiotherapy at that point. Whereas if you were looking at a large amount of numbers of different episodes, it may be that it's lots of short term episodes of absence. So uh, information that we may capture, Accident statistics, sickness absence statistics, uh, employee surveys, employee consultation data, uh, walk around feedback, corridor conversations, observation of the workforce. Uh, I once went around a, um, a factory and I was talking to a gentleman about um, uh, musculoskeletal problems and he said, we haven't got any musculoskeletal problems here. And I just said to him, can I just have a look down that line for me? We were looking down a, a, a production line and uh, probably about 50% of people wearing tubi grip on the wrists. And that's just, this is the type of thing that I'm talking about. Nobody had ever reported the problems. It was something that they expected with the job that they were working. But by observing people wearing tubi grip, we identified actually that there may be a bit of an underlying problem that's not being picked up on. How many employees do we have with individual health needs uh, picked up potentially at pre-employment or following sickness absence? How many individuals have we got with specific training needs uh, picked up on high risk activities or the training program? How many people do we have with learning difficulties and disabilities? And are we adapting our training programs to be able to ensure that they are uh, meeting their needs within the working environment? Um, I don't know if anybody's been watching this week on the television, there's been a lot of work that's been done um, on um, promoting the J-Blade stuff on, on uh, dyslexia. Uh, and it's really been remarkable to see this guy coming out and saying, at the age of 51, I'm learning to read. 
um, and that's because of dyslexia. But how many people have we got in the working environment that have got this reading ability that's um, age 11 like um, Jay Blades had? Um, you know, we we see when the fact that we'll say, I can't, I'm, I can't sign that content form because I forgot my glasses. Um, and it may be the fact that they have forgot the glasses, but it may also be the fact that it's, it's typically what we see when when people can't um, have difficulty reading. So it's, it's things like that we need to take into account. So having looked at our health needs and what the, that information is telling us, we can then look at health promotion approaches. So these are five different approaches of health promotion. Um, and this is from a, a model that was um, published a while ago by Nadu and Wills. Um, so um, we've put them down on the side. So we've got medical, educational, client-centered, behavioral change, societal change. So the medical model is the early detection of disease. So from a, um, what we've done is we've put the red ones that to your compliance, the, uh, the green ones are, are obviously the, the nice to have, and the orange ones, the business orientation ones. So, if we're looking at that, we've got um, health surveillance as your statutory requirement. That's the medical model for the um, early detection of disease. Rehabilitation planning, smoking cessation, counselling. Uh, those are the bits and pieces that we can put in early detection of disease and early treatment of disease as well within there. Then we've got the educational approach. So we are giving information on the work health effects. That's the toolbox talks. Uh, the risk assessments, the safe systems of work, all the really good uh, health and safety um, training that we put in place, the equality and diversity, that sort of stuff that's coming through from HR. Uh, how to access care. I know that sounds a little bit strange, but uh, speaking to people in occupational health uh, and making sure that they're getting at the care that they deserve. Uh, and sometimes we're having to say, actually, you do need to go back to your GP and you need to push for this because people don't push for the care that they deserve. And if you coach them through that, then they can actually access the care that's available to them. And it may be that giving them information on how to manage finances, debt management, and down to the literacy programmes that we were talking about earlier. So those are the different approaches that we can do under the education bit. Client-centred is important. You know, we can ask the employees, what is it that they want to know? So you may already have a health and safety committee with health and safety representatives on there or employee representatives on there. Ask them what they want. What is it that their representatives want from a health promotion or wellbeing strategy? Do they, do they understand what they're after? Um, involve them within the consultation and the planning or even, you know, Sometimes it's down to having drop-in clinics. I don't think they're particularly cost-effective, but I have seen them still there where you have got an occupational health team on site. Uh, from a behavioural change perspective, we're looking at positively influencing health. So we're creating this positive workplace culture, encouraging people to move more because people are fit in the, um, from a physically fit point of view tend to have less musculoskeletal problems. Do they need to have some support with diet and, and weight management? So if we're putting information out about diet and, and, and weight management, that needs to be reflected in what the options are within the canteen and the vending choices. Uh, you know, we can sit there and talk about having an apple a day and actually all you can get from the canteen is uh, a chocolate bar. I know they said the proprietary down there, but I better not. <laughs> And then looking at the societal change, I've looked at this as a society from an organisation's perspective. So again, it's your health and safety, HR, your occupational health policies, your flexible working, your anti-bullying policies, making sure that you're actually providing a, a, a fair pay, stable employment, and you know how many people are in your organisation on zero up contracts and have no stable uh, cash coming in. How many people are relying on overtime um, payments to be able to make ends meet? Right the way down to a little bit more of a lighter note, which are the cycle to work schemes and being able to buy the bikes with, with a little bit of funding from the cycle to work schemes. There isn't a right approach. We do need to have a mix, but I've just put those uh, five different approaches on there for you to think about how we can spread those out really. 
uh, within your um, wellbeing uh, initiative. So I'm getting a bit croaky now. I'm now going to pass on to James, who's uh, going to talk to you a little bit further about um, the cases that we'll be looking at. Honestly, yeah, James, I'm sorry it's stuck. There you go. So I'm going to move on to some case studies, but before I do, I just wanted to talk about the sort of prevalence of health issues within the UK. So if we're looking at the top left side of the slide, at least in the UK, one in four people have reported having a physical health condition, and 20% of those have also reported having a mental health condition. And if we go back to earlier about the amount of time taken off, the days taken off with things like this, we're looking at a lot of time taken off and a lot of money lost because of it. Um, in not getting the work done because they're not in work to do it, but also the, the sick pay and all the other things. Um, again, one in 10 report having musculoskeletal problems. Um, which again, it was, was it 10 days lost due to, to the musculoskeletal problems, 10% mm -hmm. of the days lost from musculoskeletal problems and back problems. Um, so we're going to move on to the model we mentioned earlier, the plan, do, check, act model, and what that means and how it can be put into practice. So when we're planning, it's about knowing where you are. It's about knowing what you're already doing and what you can do to improve in the future. We're identifying the right interventions because, as we've said before, there's no one right solution to this. It's knowing your, your areas and where you need to build on. Knowing the key metrics and KPIs to demonstrate your outcome. If you have the data to start with, you can take the data afterwards and you can see improvement and change. And then a big one, which is agreeing the budget and resources, which is a big challenge, especially when implementing your health and wellbeing, which is making it worthwhile to the people in charge of money. The do stage of this is launching the actual strategy, communicating with everyone who needs to be involved, whether that be line managers and employees as well. The line managers need to be no what's going on. They can help you along the way. They can implement it on a lower level as well. We check. Checking is going back over the KPIs and the metrics after the, the launch of the strategy. Um, it's important to go back and make sure that what we're doing is working from, from all areas. And then afterwards we can act, which is tweaking it, improving it and helping us move on. Oh, one of us. Well, you and me. <laughs> so we'll start with my first case study then. It's from a company called Ben Nedden Health, which is a healthcare provider responsible for over 800,000 members. And they found that their problem was um, they were losing a lot of money due to sickness absence. So they were losing 372 days um, through mental health, and that was equating to £36,465. And that, when that's combined with the sickness absence due to acute illnesses like coughs, colds, infections and gastro bugs, we're looking at well over £100,000. And they decided that they needed to start reducing that, that um, the short-term sickness absence costs um, and using their health and wellbeing plan to do so. So in terms of their plan then, they had to research into what they were already doing. So they found that they were already had a wellbeing plan in place, but it was scattered and it wasn't cohesive. They had an on-site gym, eye care vouchers, and flexible working hours, but these weren't helping them achieve the goal that was in place. They also started looking into what other things they could do and what their competitors were doing to be able to, um, to build their own program. So when it came to developing their strategy, they, they um, decided on their key focuses. These were promoting an active and healthy lifestyle, staying well, so once we've recovered from illness, staying, staying healthy afterwards, and improving the mental well-being of their workforce. To decide on the following, um, they decided to use the following initiatives because they were realistic and they were within the budget they set. So they had ideas such as free fruit in the office, healthy food and vending machines, which we've already spoken about before, exercise classes available on breaks and lunches um, through external structures, things such as yoga for improvement of musculoskeletal problems, 
Um, they had high intensity classes to help with um, physical fitness and things like that. Um, they set themselves monthly fitness challenges, so they used posters and flyers to set um, walking challenges for the month who could get more steps in. They had um, roll the channel challenges um, where they would, would advertise to everyone to get on a row machine and record what they've done um, to get them more fit, to get them active. They also introduced mental health first aiders, which um, was set up to, to help with the, the conversations around mental health. Um, workshops, which were, were educational workshops on, on financial education, which is the world, but also on diet and health, healthy lifestyles. The next stage was getting the management commitment, um, presenting this to the management team and, and um, being able to actually enforce what they were doing. So they went in with the clear aims that they've already set and um, introduced the budget and they had to, had to justify that budget with, with the cost effectiveness. Um, they presented with the KPIs and key metrics in, from, from before, the how many days off and how much money was being lost. Um, and this overall gave them the ability to get management buy-in and, and implement their plan, which takes us on to the do section. So do, launching a strategy. So it was important to trial certain things because they weren't sure how effective they were going to be in the first instance. Um, so exercise classes were trialed because of the cost of getting an external instructor in. And they have to get the buy-in from the employees. So was it worthwhile? Where are we going to get the um, employees in the classes to, to justify paying for it? Um, and some some things were bought in on a, in, uh, immediately with, with six month reviews. So that was the mental health um, first aiders. They were bought in immediately uh, because of the cost of getting people through training for that. And, and then it was implemented and reviewed every six months. They also had the lead by example scheme, which was um the line managers being sort of a role model for the rest of the staff and management team being a role model for the rest of the staff so putting it out there that the people who are implementing it are actually also doing this they are involved in themselves and that gets a bit more buy-in from the employees because they're then more willing to do it because you can see it's being done and then it came to the checks so they're going back over the 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 results of it after finishing it. Um, it was reviewed at a regular basis. It was on a six month basis. And they found that the main causes of sickness absence was reduced. So that was the, the acute illnesses that was reduced. Uh, staff more comfortable talking about mental health and they, they, they found that they could express themselves more in the workplace and, and go in and talk about mental health, the struggles they were having and they could get their support as well. Um, and 38% of all the staff were actually frequently engaged in the fitness challenges monthly, so they were, they were buying into what was going on. The downfall of this case study is that we would know um, act, after the check, they didn't go back over it and they didn't um, fix the problems that were already there. There's, no, there's also no quantitative data out there to suggest how much the sickness absence was reduced by. Yeah, we're not saying that they haven't done it, it's just it's not published. It's not it's, this, this is where we're struggling, is, is there's, there's no quantifiable data that we can all rely on to say this equals this. Um, and you know, you're just going to have to monitor it yourself in your own work and environment, really. So, my next case study to talk about is with Humberside Police, and this was published on the Health and Safety website from 2006. Um, and Humberside Police identified that they were having high levels of long-term sickness absence. Um, and their aim was just to reduce the sickness absence cost that was associated with this. So it was, it was all staff across the, uh, the police force. Um, so their plan was to implement sickness absence policies and robust case management through um, occupational health. Uh, so they introduced the, the case management and found that they actually reduced their sickness absence by £250,000 a year, um, which is a great sum of money to be, to be saving there. But again, there is no act, there's no follow-up on that, and there's no, no other data out there to support that. Okay, 
So these are another, this is another um, uh, tool that we've played with actually, is, is something called the Lifestyle Checkpoint. Uh, the Lifestyle Checkpoint, it's, uh, it's a kiosk, you may have seen them round and about, uh, very similar, uh, there's different, different ones on the market, this is the one that we've specifically played with. Um, and uh, we had one delivered within to our working environment and um, uh, lots of people had a go at it. Uh, and you probably take about five minutes, you follow the instructions on the screen and you have a range of different tests that are done and you get a, a, a feedback sheet. But um, this is a, a, what we're seeing from a, a principal contractor um, in the construction industry. Uh, we've come across it a few times where the principal contractor has put in the contract that the, uh, the contractor is required to provide a health and well-being initiative for everybody on that particular site um, or, or demonstrate that they've done something for their uh, employees. So that the, the motivation for doing something is obviously contractual uh, compliance um, and it's something that we've been involved in. Some people have used these lifestyle checkpoints we've done, we've been down and we've put specific you know, uh, one-to-one -one training or group work training in place. So it depends on what you want to do really. Uh, but these are quite cute really. Um, so it's a self-service health and well-being information point. Um, it does give you the information. I put you like a printout of what you would get from the side there. So it goes through things like your BMI, your body temperature, your blood pressure, pulse, body fat, visceral fat, body, uh, body water, which is great to see if people are hydrated or not, uh, muscle, bone, mass, metabolism and oxygen levels. So that's great. Um, unfortunately, there's no supporting information that goes with it. So you do need to develop your own supporting information because it's great to know that this is what my blood pressure is. But they don't tell you what you've got to do to try and reduce it if it comes out high. Um, so you do need to be able to provide that supporting information as well. The good thing about these is, is it also gives you trend analysis. Um, and so you're able to download information that tells you what's going on within your working environment. So how many of the people that went on the lifestyle checkpoint have got high blood pressure, that are dehydrated or something along those lines. Um, and so, um, and just to point out, in addition to this is the basic model, you can also get the more expensive and heavier versions. So you can't move them around as easily because these, these break into bits and they can go in your car and you can move them from site to site and put them on each site that you may be working with for a month at a time and rotate them around. The heavier versions, unfortunately, uh, are the better versions in some respects because you can put on there your workplace stress risk assessment, your heart age and um, uh, cardiovascular disease risk assessment. Uh, you can put NHS choices information on there, uh, support network in the chat room and that sort of stuff. Um, but as I say, they're harder to, uh, to move. Um, and then if you put these on, so these, these particular ones were put into sites located outside canteens uh, and it was taken off the, the website itself uh, and it was done by Carillion, I think this one was, um, and it was about communicating that the service was available to employees, they don't put the name in so there's no GDPR issue uh, and they did provide some supporting data. I think Next also did something along those lines as well, which was really well received. So the trend, trend data was collected and, um, and can be analysed. Interestingly enough, we've only got qualitative data, again, uh, from uh, employee feedback uh, in relation to these particular ones, but there's no reason why you can't put this information onto the site and then put something else um, uh, in as well. So this isn't a compliance delivered stuff. It's a nice to have stuff, but it's a, it's a, um, it can be hired this equipment. So it's, it, it can be just done from a contractual compliance perspective rather than a uh, health and safety compliance. So actions on the back of this I'm aware of is uh, we got picked up with uh, dehydration issues. So the company gave water bottles out to employees. Um, we had some people that had got high blood pressure and what we find is, is that people are drinking these energy drinks. And so on this particular one, I was talking to a guy who came back and said, can you take the blood pressure, it was high. Um, and he'd stopped drinking the energy drinks um, with all the ca additional caffeine in. And his blood pressure was back to normal. This was a 22-year-old lad that had got sky high blood pressure. It was back to normal within a two-week period. So 
Um, despite the fact that they had been warned about the energy drinks, that actual reading itself did make a difference and it did motivate him to change his behaviours. Um, Peer-led weight loss competitions, um, you know, we're getting on there and, and, and having a see so you can weigh and, and, and lose as much in, uh, weight as you could over a four-week period. And then there was an increase, just a qualitative feedback of increasing supportive uh, banter um, within the canteens and within uh, employees themselves uh, on the healthy behaviours themselves. So, you know, the, these are uh, different approaches that you can take. So there's lots of initiatives that have been published out there. Um, you know, we've participated in some, we tend to go more along the compliance perspective to be fair, but we have done all sorts of things uh, in relation to drugs and alcohol. Uh, uh, we've done uh, pub quizzes, we've done what for wellbeing initiatives and things like that. Um, what we struggle with is when you're doing the generic stuff is getting the quantifiable data to be able to justify what we are doing. So it needs to be done. Um, this is me as the Yorkshire person saying this. If you're doing the generic stuff that you can't cost benefit, you need to keep the actual cost of the, the initiative down so that it's not as uh, galling for the finance director who tends to have the yes or no say so. Um, so evidence your strategy, tell them what you've got. If you can't get quantifiable uh, data of, of percentages, then look at your quality of data and then see if you can pull the themes out and quantify the themes. Um, sickness absence data and costs like that act as a really good motivator. Things like how much is how much does it cost us in, in insurance claims and musculoskeletal, all that sort of quantitative cost data is really good at motivating um, the person with the purse strings, I find. Um, so from a takeaway perspective, what I want you to think about is uh, from well-being, good health and safety and good HR promotes good well-being. Okay, let's get that bit sorted first. Plan your, organize, your activities based on your organisational needs and collect that data so you've got comparable data. Uh, don't put everything in it all at one go because you won't know what's been effective and what hasn't been effective if you're looking at generic data. Do use your plan, do, check, act approach, and then you can look at that from uh, if you wanted to include all these activities within your 45,001 um, uh, initiative. It's a good approach to have anyway. Involve your staff, take the different health promotion approaches because one size doesn't fit all. Monitor your outcomes and tweak. You're not going to get it right first time. Not everything's going to be an overwhelming success. Uh, but there is, uh, I think there's more than one way of skinning the cat, but please don't shout at me if that's not politically correct enough. Uh, look at those protective and uh, risk factors that we were talking about before. So the diet, the mood, the literacy, the stable employment, the support network, the smoking, drug and alcohol, mental health initiatives. They're the ones that are dovetailing into national campaigns. And so you may be able to get some funding or literature free of charge or downloadable as a result of those. Um, yeah, we wanted to just tell you about this because I'm not sure if you're aware of that and I don't know whether it's worthwhile for going through any questions on the uh, health and wellbeing stuff that's coming up. I'm being aware that stuff's been coming up on the chat but I can't see it all. What's your thoughts, guys? Everybody's on mute at the moment. We've got a few questions, but not a great deal. So if we start doing the questions and answers now, if you're ready, and then obviously as we talk about things, people then want to ask other questions. So do you want to crack on with Q&As? Okay, right. So I'm just going back up to the chat room to scroll my way down. So people have answered in the between time. Uh, yeah. I've got I've got the list. So I've, I've got two from Peter Jenkins. So I'll invite Peter to put his mic on and he's putting himself on screen and he can answer two questions. And then we've got Linda Parkinson after Peter. I say everyone should have the rights now to unmute and uh, start their video. Good afternoon, Peter. Good afternoon. Apologies, I wasn't expecting to be on camera bars and worn a tie this afternoon. How are you? Are you okay? Exactly. 
you? How are you? Good, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. A little bit flustered. I feel like I haven't even turned the lights on or anything. I've just sat here in the dark. It probably isn't great for my well-being, but anyway, nevertheless. So I'll jump in with uh, the question that I've, I've got. This is the first one that I've come to in the chat there. So have you experienced that some employee age brackets strongly desire certain well-being initiatives over others? Or is the split of domains generally equal throughout all ages? Uh, it's a really good question. And I'm going to be absolutely honest with you, Peter, and say, because we're an external provider, we don't tend to see the, the employee initiatives. From my experience over the years, what I tend to see, and people are going to shoot me for this one, considering the discussion that we're having, is, is the people that are really healthy want the health and well-being initiatives. The people that perhaps aren't great at looking after their health tend to ignore them. So when we started looking at the data, and it was interesting to see the data that, that um, uh, James had, uh, when he was saying that 38% of people were involved in regular challenges, I really wanted to ask them, well, how many of those were actually involved in health and wellbeing activities before hand and has that actually influenced that? So um, I, think, I think it's, uh, the, the simple answer is, is I have absolutely no idea. Um, and, uh, you know, get your data and find out for your own organisation, because what happens in your organisation will be different from ours. And, and it's about reacting to your own feedback from employees, from talking to people, you know, get your own needs assessments done and get those people involved in it and try and get that fear, that client led uh, approach in place. And then hopefully it will be a little bit more meaningful to them. No, terrific. Thank you so much for that. P Paul, I'm going to have to bounce this back to you for a second because I've furiously been scrolling up and down the chat and I cannot find my second question if I'd asked it. So, yeah. Uh, it was your first one. It said, it doesn't seem that long ago that wellbeing programs were smoothies, bikes, and leaflets. Uh, is that sort of pretty in mind what you were thinking along them lines? Um, do you know, I tell you, it, it was just a comment, really. It was, All just, right, okay. it was just that it was great to see sort of the different considerations as part of it. But it does, I do actually have a question associated with it, if that's all right. It's fine, and it, yeah. And it was just to, to what extent do you think that work rooted wellbeing initiatives should consider engaging the employee's home life or home environment at the same time? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think I'm going to go back to the show me the money thing, really, because uh, what, what I would say to you is, is if you get too giddy and carried away with how much you want to achieve, then you, you run the risk of being told no overall. So, um, fairy steps, get yourself started with your employees first. When you've got your employees through that, you'll find that as they talk and they use social media and they talk to the mates, the information starts to spread that way anyway. You know, so what, what, was, what you may find is, is that they're then starting to talk about their experiences. Um, so, for example, if we, you know you can have a conversation with somebody about mental health and you can give them some tips about managing it and they'll share it themselves and, and it kind of disseminates through that route. So I think that whatever you do for an individual has the potential to hit other people anyway. And you always share it with the people that you love first. Um, and it's probably going to go out into the community. Um, if you're looking at something that's got more um, financial impact, so things like um, I'm going to put in a, uh, an employee wellbeing package uh, and I'm going to cover their insurance, I'm unlikely to cover the family's insurance, but that'd be a useful thing. But then there's no reason why you can't invite the families to pay for that top up. So, you know, it's, it's about looking at it to see what you can do. But I would always say start with fairy, step, fairy steps. If you ask for the world, you're going to get nothing. If you just ask for little bits at a time and demonstrate that you've um, got that cost benefit, then um, they're more likely to be more successful at the next more adventurous um, at, um, initiative. Brilliant. No, thank you ever so much for that. Um, I'm going to put a link to a podcast that I caught just literally on, on today uh, in the chat. And it's about a, a couple of examples from South Africa engaging with mining uh, employees and how their home safe activities have been engaging people in work and at home by design so for anyone that's interested as well it's a good it's a just a link to very nicely to what you've just said there about starting small 
but through design and stepping up, you can engage home life as well. So I no, really appreciate that. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. That's really helpful. Thank you. Right then, thanks, Peter. We're going to move on to Linda Parkinson. Are you there? I am. Just, uh, unmuting. Yeah, I was just wondering in your experience how effective you think so contractually driven initiatives are. Um, are they the the new fruit bowl and posters, or do you find that they are set up properly? I think the temptation could be if you're contractually obliged to provide something. To, to just set something up without the, the support and the commitment behind that to keep it going. I think it depends on the people that are involved in the actual initiative as always, Linda. Uh, we got pulled in to support um, somebody who'd been told that they had to do something and we got about two weeks notice to put something in place. We spoke to the principal contractor and said, what is it that you're wanting, you know, and, and they wanted the moon on a plate in a day, you know, uh, and that doesn't necessarily happen. So what we did was we, we sent them a load of posters down for um, the uh, the canteen, you know, the really uh, funny ones that you can get for the construction industry. But then we focused on things like um, uh, the typical uh, toolbox talk stuff. And each group that came in went through uh, silica noise, um, uh, skins and we did fun in the sun actually as well because it was that red hot summer and, and all we did was we, we just put on that, I don't know if you've seen the Switch Like Pop campaign that came out of Austria, Australia, it's been the single most effective health promotion um, uh, video ever so we just asked them to look at that and comment on why they thought that that was the single most effective uh, health promotion activity ever uh, and they made them watch them this, this, this song, that, this singing crow cartoon um, but they were saying that it, it was the first time that actually engaged in the toolbox talk and the feedback from those sessions was really, really positive. So the people that attended thought it was amazing, but you're only hitting a small proportion of the organisation in there. So, you know, if you want to say, was it successful? If it's a successful in the fact that it's changed some of the behaviours within that environment, then it was successful. If you want to say, well, it only hit 5% of the people on that building site, building site, it was unsuccessful. So it depends on what your markers were, really. Uh, yeah. But there's the potential to say um, uh, it's another fruit bowl and poster thing. Um, there's always going to be that, isn't there? There is. And I think uh, coming from the construction industry myself, uh, what we've found with our, our campaigns is that they have to be absolutely committed to and supported and um, and and people can show that it's not just a hollow gesture. Otherwise, that just leads to more disillusionment and, well, they're only doing this to please the clients or to look good. Um, so it is tri trying really to get that people-centred approach, isn't it, and find out what people actually do need and would appreciate. Yeah, and I think that if, if you're going to put it in a contract, put specifics in the contract. And, you know, if you've got 10 contractors on site, and you you want health promotion, then just say, I don't say in the contract, I want you to commit to providing us with a health promotion campaign. Then what you do is, is you say to me, I want a health promotion campaign and yours is this, and I want it delivered between these ones to these amount of people. Cost it in. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it, they have to be a bit more specific, otherwise they could get away with the fact that, you know, it, it does not get uh, planned until the last minute. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we've got a lot of um, really good tools and I don't know if uh, any of you have seen Julian speak, it was Julian that went down to London with a suitcase full of um, balloon pumps and all sorts of stuff to talk about face fit testing and respiratory disease and they've got blue tack and penny pieces and did all that lot of stuff, but it's all very, very visual. Um, you know, but that's something that, that we're used to providing. So to give us a couple of weeks notice, we were able to put something quite substantial together within that time period. You know, it does need to be planned and it does need to, to, to have some kind of um, aim and objective, you know. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. There were another, there were another thing you were talking about, I don't know if it was a general comment, Linda, about uh, next session on wellbeing and financial. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's at the forefront of everyone's minds, isn't it? Uh, there's a lot in the media about it. Inflation's rising, cost of living's rising. And then, of course, we've got the um, 
the changes both to the energy price cap and the um, national insurance coming up in April. So we thought it'd be good to just have a look at people's um, financial hygiene, as it were. I mean, we're not we're not financial experts, but through the business, um, we can offer consultations with one to one consultants. But just first of all, to give people a little bit of a, an introductory session that is being led by our finance director on you know, good budgeting, how to where to find information about the best deal for energy, where to find information about loans and consolidation and just signposting really on, on, the, on the one hand and then offering the follow up um, of, of further information if people feel that they need that. And, and again, it's, it's trying to do that in a way that doesn't come across as the follow up is, oh, well, maybe if you paid us more. Um, so it is mm -hmm. a little balancing act of, of the direction you come with that sort of information, I think. But um, especially for some of our um, site guys that, you know, some of them do still live pay, pay packet to pay packet. Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps it's, it's not something that was taught in school when I was at school, you know, how to run a successful household budget. So it's, it's really going, taking back to basics and just offering some general advice on how to protect people really against these rising costs. Yeah. Well done. Really, really good um, uh, proactive approach. And this is going back to the stuff that we were talking about with this, these protective factors. You know, if you're looking at this stable employment and, and the, uh, the stuff from the DWP about that support and that, um, yeah, I guess what you're talking about is numeric, numerical and financial literacy there, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, we've just recently changed uh, last year our pay structure for uh, the people that are still on timesheet based wages so that they're paid more. Um, they're, they're paid more um, on a regular basis. The rates have gone up, as it were, uh, rather than being reliant on good bonuses. Um, what we found in, in when the pandemic first hit is the company weren't in a position to pay good bonuses. Um, and that really brought to the forefront how much some of these site-based workers rely on that really to, as a wage top up. So by redressing that balance and making sure that they know that week in, week out, they're earning more, it, 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 it hopefully will put people in a better position. Yeah, that is great news. Thanks for that, Linda. We have uh, a Jean Illingworth next. Are you still there, Jean? Hi. Hi, Jean. Hello. Yeah, I had a question. There's something I've just been writing a policy on, and it was, I don't know why I'd never thought of it before being a woman, but I just realised that a lot of companies' wellbeing po policies do not cover menopause. And if you've got you know, 50% of your workforce, perhaps the ladies, and of those, a group might be anywhere in the age between 30 and 50, which potentially could be into perimenopause and menopause. Because it's such a private subject and such a personal subject, people don't talk about it. And you might have ladies that are really struggling uh, day to day, um, you know, with the obvious things like, um, you know, overheating, but also, you know, not sleeping, uh, brain fog, fog and all the other symptoms that can come along with it. And because um, for the average length of menopause is four years, but for some ladies it can be as much as 12 years, in many cases, it'll come under the definition of a disability and reasonable adjustments. Now, those reasonable adjustments could be as simple as a fan or starting work a little bit later if they're having sleep problems or um, changing to a less demanding job. But because it's something people sort of keep to themselves and sort of soldier on, and often quite a high percentage of ladies will take early retirement or, or, or leave the workplace completely, it's almost like a hidden problem. And my question was just, you know, how many health and wellbeing policies actually consider uh, this significant um, difficulty that a lot of ladies uh, have uh, on, on a regular basis? And, and think about it in terms of, you know, the health and wellbeing of the workforce. Amanda's frozen, huh? Oh dear. The screen's not moving. Hello. You're, Hello. Back, you're, back, Amanda. you're back in the room. I'm up, okay. <laughs> I think it's a good it was a, it's a good comment actually, Jean. And 
And what uh, what we did see, and actually um, from last year, there was a, a, a big surge in it, and it came on the back of the Davina McCall programme that was on the menopause, and there was a lot of people sort of discussing it after that. And I do think some of these um, these uh, celebrities that are going through um, the uh, highlighting these issues, and we were talking about the J-Blades and the dyslexia mm -hmm. yesterday, but... The, the Davina McCall thing, um, you know, I, re I remember seeing an awful lot of things coming through about the menopause as a result of that, and it is certainly being heightened on awareness. What I, 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 I wanted to say, though, is, is if you've got a good health and well-being policy, then why should menopause be singled out? You know, we talked about um, making reasonable adjustments, whether it's a disability or not then if people are struggling at work because, you know, I mean, it might go on to the fact that um, new, new mums and dads can't sleep because they've got um, a child that's waking up at stupid o'clock in the morning or, um, you know, an, an interrupting the sleep or, you know, it, it could be anything and everything. It might be the fact that they're a single parent and they can't get to work on that time with the dropping off with the childcare issues. It could be anything. And it is about talking to people and having the culture that allows that open door, comfortable discussion, uh, and seeing people act on that advice so that it's working to the benefit of the individuals. I mean, obviously there's parameters that, that businesses have to work to because at the end of the day, business is a business, isn't it? Um, and there's certain things that we've got to be able to do. Um, but I think, yes, I think menopause is a big deal. Um, there is a potential that you could lose a lot of people mm. in the working environment as a result of menopause if you don't make those adjustments because people do struggle. And, um, and I think that highlighting those issues and signposting again, just like mental health, it's helping people to understand what the, the range of the problems are that they can experience. So um, I don't know whether you need a specific menopause policy. I think if you've got a general health and wellbeing policy that allows any health issue to be addressed through reasonable adjustment I think that that should suffice but um yeah I, I don't know. What's your I think, I, th I, think I, I absolutely agree with you. If you've got good health policies and good support, then it should cover everything. I think the difference with this, because it's only potentially 50% of the workforce and it tends to be so private and personal, is people really don't think that those health policies actually apply to them. And it's, you know, it's, it, they're sort of dealing with it in secret. So I think, as you say, it's the signposting. It's making sure it's quite clear. Actually, this is, you know, this could apply to and include menopause in your list of things like people who drink problems or back problems or sleep and just make sure including that so people know that the the, the things you do for everybody actually includes them um and then other, and other than that is that as you say if you've got good support that should co uh, cover all conditions and all, all issues that people have thank you you've got another part there aren't you jane you were looking at as well how do you capture stress weight in lost days do you want to explain that one yes thank you very much uh paul um Something that I noticed when I was um, in industry um, was very much that people who were suffering from stress, whether it's work related or life related, the sick notes or the self certs would say, and, and probably genuinely the case, you know, stomach problems, um, headaches, other, other, other problems that are actually were symptoms of stress. And all we were doing, all they were doing, and perhaps we were doing, was dealing with the symptoms, not the root cause. And what I took to doing in analysing with HR departments sickness absence was very much looking at people how, who had regular absence through perhaps a, a mishmash of different symptoms and looking and seeing if actually there was a stress element there. Uh, and, and I think this is this, there's always been this embarrassment. You don't want to say you can't, the, you know, the traditional view, if you can't stand the heat, get out the ki kitchen. But, you know, stress and admitting that you're suffering from stress is you, you frighten the people that you can't cope. So the tendency is, is not to actually admit that's a problem. And it's just important that we look a little bit wider when analysing sickness absence and try and pick up the hidden uh, uh, people st suffering from stress. I think that's a really good point. And, you know, we're talking about analysis of sickness absence mm -hmm. and using the SART tool that we talked about earlier. That's a really useful thing to do. So instead of just looking at the day's loss cost, we talked about looking at the, um, the episodes of, um, of sickness absence yeah. as well. And, you know, what I tend to see is a very clear, it looks like a radiation sign. You know, you get those three um, major areas. Uh, what we tend to see is things like um, colds and flus, DMVs, 
and headaches and migraines and yeah. it'll light up and what what i see is people rotating between between all of them so yeah maybe having a duvet day because they've had enough of, and i've got a headache and i better not have a headache because i had a headache last time so i'm gonna have diarrhea and sickness this time and then it rotates around so you mm. know when you've got a, a department within your organization that's showing that very clear sort of you know the big three um, it's worth looking for looking closer to that data and, and, and having starting to have more of a corridor conversations in that particular area so uh, I would agree with you you know the, those little bits of short-term absence yes. are quite good indicators yeah we've got quite right thank you right thanks for what I said Jean we've got Kevin Yates it's a bit more of a, a statement but would you like to speak Kevin and explain what your thoughts are it was about the, yep. having occupational health yep occupational health um it's good to have an occupational health system in uh, place within the business it will then give you a baseline throughout the business uh, and obviously continue to surveillance over the years will show an improvement in the business or a decline and if it's a decline for an individual then you can uh, look at further help and assistance from medical practitioners and it can also be used for the business to assist and help with any defense of any claim that may come against you for civil claims such as hearing loss, HABs, that type of thing. So just to add on to that, my previous employer had um, 105 tests carried out. And when the tests were carried out on individuals, 50% uh, were proved to be um, with hearing loss. And several of them had other issues that required uh, assistance from medical practitioners. Yeah, it's quite common actually, Kevin, and it is important to have that data and know what you're doing with it as well. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it's great that you're looking at it. From our perspective, we see employers inviting us into doing the health surveillance and they don't ever open the reports. <laughs> so the fact that you're opening the reports is brilliant. So well done. you. That brings us nicely on to talking about noise-induced hearing loss. If there's no other questions, Paul, can I just sort of explain to you, you've got some changes to the control of noise at work, Reg, so you might find that you're getting a lot more cat threes than you, you would expect to see. Is that okay for me to go ahead there, or is there some other bits and pieces that, that need to be covered from the questions on chat? Uh, just to uh, speak away, we've got a little bit of time. Okay, so thank you for that. So uh, um, for those of you not aware, there was an update in the guidance from the HSE on the control of noise at work regulations. And within that, I'm the, I don't know, I haven't gone into the, the ins and outs of everything because they don't do like a, a, a what's changed summary, unfortunately. But I wanted you to be aware of the changes to the audiometry classifications that were published. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we'll talk twice before yeah. well. Uh, okay. got, uh, there. Um, <laughs> the, the mic's still on, so phone. Um, so what we're looking at now is, is where we had before the very clear ca uh, categories of one, two, three, four, those categories remain. But what is new is this bit here. We now have to assess, we're interpreting the audiometry results themselves based on the patterns that we're seeing on the audiometer. Of, on the audiogram itself. So what we're looking for is this presence or absence of noise-induced hearing loss on the pattern, okay? If that's there and it's newly identified, then they are automatically now a category three. So you can have a mild drop, if you like, of noise-induced hearing loss, but it's new and it now goes in as a category three, okay? If it's been there for years, so if we've got lots of hearing tests from this particular person and it's not changed over the last three years, then we can call it stable. And so they will drop from a category three to a category two. But even if they're not hitting those traditional sums of the hearing levels at one, two, three and six, we are still having to categorise them as a, um, a two or a three because they've got a noise induced hearing loss pattern. So because there isn't that much guidance about over what's a high noise induced hearing uh, loss pattern within the noise at work classifications, what we've done is we've gone back to uh, what's called the black book. And the black book tells us 
uh, from a legal perspective, what we're looking at for a sign of noise induced hearing loss on an audio. So when we're looking at this, we're looking for uh, a notch predominantly. So those of you that have been working with us will recognize this concept of having a notch in the hearing loss that indicates some sign of noise induced hearing loss. And you'll be able to see it here. So that's a notch. Now that is affected by age induced hearing loss as well as, um, and so what you may see is a little bit of age induced hearing loss as well as noise induced hearing loss. And it then shows as a bulge away from the normal age loss line. So we do need to have the age loss line in there. We need to understand what that is. And we're looking for this bulge in between. And that bulge is only 10 decibel difference, guys. That's what the definition is. So if we're looking at these for the interpretation of results, for those of you who have not heard from the occupational health companies, you may notice that there's a, there will appear statistically a, a, a significant deterioration in your results this year. It's because of the changes in the noise at work regulation interpretation of audiometry categorizations. And it's because we're now having to start interpreting that. So those of you that have got um, um, people coming on site who are interpreted, uh, interpreting the audio purely on the numbers, you need to remind them to go back to the regulations and check that they are fulfilling the requirements of the regulations as they state. So a little bit uh, of a, a change there that may make a significant difference to you guys when you're looking at your data. Uh, has anybody got any questions on that while we're here? And I'm going to shamelessly put that back up again there at the end. Any questions? I haven't got the chat open. I've lost the chat, so I don't know. Nothing. Done silence. Okay. Right then. I think you've explained yourself very well, to be honest. Uh, there's going to be very few questions. Cool. Right, well, if that, um, that's it from us. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you all for attending this afternoon. And um, I, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it. And uh, if you want to contact us um, through IOSH, if you need any help for anything, then please don't hesitate to contact us. And please, 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 even if it's only a quid, please do support Bo. Let's help her get some treatment. And um, it's the Just Giving pages up there for you. And thank you. So thanks a lot, Amanda and James. It's been a very useful session, very informative. And the brands really appreciate you giving up your time to speak for us. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. On, I hope everyone's enjoyed today. Excellent session. Look out for the future ones.